We are glad you're here this morning. Listen, I'm so proud of our praise team. Y'all don't know how much effort they put into leading. They meet once a week at least. Yeah, you can. <laughs> at least once a week they're practicing, and they have uh, Rorick is helping them, and, and sometimes some other adults are pouring into them. So I'm proud to say they're going to be leading us this morning. But here's what I want you to be aware of. They're going to sing some songs that you may not know, and that's okay. Because every song they sing is biblically founded, and um, they just do a really good job. And you'll hear more about that later on. I, I am uh, Marty. I'm the student pastor. And if you're visiting with us this morning, we are so glad you're here. I know that with the rain, sometimes a lot of people get kind of sidetracked and don't want to come out. But you've made the effort to be here. And for that, we are never take that for granted. We're thankful that you're here with us this morning. Uh, one thing I do want to ask you is... We want a record of you being here. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to bombard you with all kinds of emails or phone calls or anything else. We just want to know that you were here and worshiping with us so we can pray for you as a staff and as a, 
as individuals going forward. So if you would be so kind, in the front of your bulletin or the middle of your bulletin, it says church or guest information. If you would fill that out and you can drop it in one of the four boxes as you leave, or you could do even better and come back to that booth, that table in the very back corner back there, because after the service, me and Amber are going to be standing back there, and we would love to meet you and give you a gift from the church. If you don't like to write, but you're tech savvy, there's a QR code in the top corner that you can fill that out, and it'll take you to a link, and you can just fill it all out from there. But we really want to know you were here just so we can be praying for you as a staff. Now then, I'm going to open us in prayer, and when I finish, I'm going to ask that you turn toward the baptism, because we get to experience baptism this morning. And uh, we're excited about that. So open us. Look, yeah, you can. Come on, y'all. Wake up. Listen. I got to tell you, for the 8, eight o'clock service, it's like pulling teeth to get interaction. And I bragged on you this morning. I said, we don't have to do this in the 1045 service. They're awake. So y'all need to don't make, don't make me a liar, okay? Let's get excited. I'm going to pray for us, and then y'all watch, watch the, the baptistry. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for everyone who's here this morning. God, I pray a very special blessing over our time together. I pray that you'll use the words of the songs and the ones who are delivering the words to bless you and to bless our time together. Lord, I thank you for their talent that you've given them and for their willingness to share this uh, with the church. God, I pray that you'll be with Pastor David as he leads us in uh, our message this morning. It's a very impactful message that uh, we all need to hear. Lord, I pray that you'll be with Lucas as he um, goes through this baptism, Lord, that he'll make a priority in his life, serving you and loving others in the way that you've called us to. God, we love you, and we pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. So glad that you're here today. Uh, most of you know this is my son, Lucas, and, you know, it's a great story. Uh, about six or seven years ago when, when Lucas and his brother Joshua were uh, younger, uh, I baptized them both here. They were saved and baptized. But lately, Lucas is, and I have been having some conversation, and Lucas just told me, he said, Dad, you know, listen, um, I know I was saved and baptized when I was 11, but he said, I just feel like that I was just going through the motions. He said, I was doing what a pastor's kid is supposed to do, right? And we talked about it quite a bit, and he was talking about his experience last, this past summer at student camp. Um, how he really gave his life to the Lord. And he, yeah, I think that's awesome, yeah. Um, and he wanted to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And, I, and you know, I just love what he said, because he said, that, that I want it to be my faith. And that's true for all of us, right? You can't get to heaven on your mom and dad's faith. You can't get to heaven on, on what your last name is or whatever. It, it's got to be yours. And, and so, Lucas, I'm proud of you. I told him I was going to cry. Um, but I'm, I'm proud of you for owning your faith. And uh, maybe you're here today, and maybe, maybe your faith is somebody else's. Maybe your faith is not the real deal. It's got to be yours. The Bible says in Philippians that you work out your own salvation. It's done in community. You do it in the church setting, but you work out your own salvation. So, Lucas, I want to ask you just one simple question. Do you know for certain you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Amen. It is my honor and it is my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Jesus in baptism. <laughs> risen to walk in the newness of life. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. For your goodness, thank you, Lord, for lives that are changed. And God, I pray that there's somebody here today that desperately needs you. That God, today will be the day of salvation for them. God, be with us as we worship you in music and in song. God, open our hearts to your word. And God, I pray all this very boldly and confidently in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless.
Hey, didn't our youth do a great job? Wow. Fantastic. Um, I, here's what I love about, about what you just witnessed. I, I know some of them were a little nervous, and, and here's what I know. I, I know that it's not just about singing songs for them, um, because I think what else was happening was I know I've talked to a few of them. They've been talking about the songs. They've been discussing the songs theologically and talking about are, are these songs biblically accurate and theologically sound. And I, I think that's incredible that we have teenagers that are discussing things like that. And they're not, not just up here singing the song because it's a cool song, right? So, so Marty, thank you for you and all that your uh, volunteers and the, and the youth and student ministry do. Thank you for... Um, pouring into our teens and that's kind of what we're talking about today yeah amen we can give that a round of applause yeah today I'm going to start this this new series it's really going to be two weeks it's going to be this week and next week called generations and I've really been thought, thought about this a, a great deal because we we need I, I love the fact that Leoma Baptist Church is a multi-generational 
church. That's what I love about our church. We, we have a lot of babies and preschoolers and infants and children. We have teenagers. We have college students. We have middle-aged adults. We have a lot of gray-haired, no-haired senior adults. Amen? And, and, and we love that, right? That's awesome. And we all learn together. We all grow together. Um, and, and so, listen, today I'm going to start this series called Generations. Today we're going to actually talk about the importance of us investing in the next generation. Now, I want you to come back next week because next week we're going to kind of focus on the 55-year-olds and older, the double nickels and over, right? Um, And so that's you. Um, I encourage you to be here next week. We're actually going to do some really good things for you. Actually, during the small group hour at 930, all of those who are 55 years of age and older, we're going to have you down in the gym and we're going to have a brunch just for you. So come hungry. Uh, we're going to kind of skip small group that day and come and we're going to all the 55 year. If you're not 55, go to your regular small group. You'll be fine. Um, but if you're over 55, we want you down in the gym. We're going to have a special time for you. Um, just, to, uh, just to gift you. Our staff's going to be down there. We're going to love on you and thank you for all that you do. It's also next week as our church's 110th birthday. As a church. Isn't that incredible? Yeah, 110 years of legacy. Amen? Yeah. So you're not going to want to miss that. So be here this week and next week. Uh, I will go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Uh, That's where we're going to go because, uh, and as you're turning there, let me kind of make this statement that I heard just a couple of weeks ago that just really rocked my world. I hope it rocks yours too. (laughs) Here's the statement. It said, it said, Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that phrase? I mean, it's, it's been that way for a while. And if that's true, if that's a true statement, I, I'm wondering what the message is for the church in that. What, what do we as a church need to learn from that statement? If, if, if truly Christianity is really just one generation away from extinction, what's the message to the church in that and I think here's the message it's very important for us it's a vital importance to us to invest in the next generation amen? amen we've got to do that we've got to invest in the next generation so here if you're new to LBC if you're new to Leoma Baptist Church maybe you've never been here before I know we've got some first-time guests and we're glad that you're here um, this was what you need to know about Leoma Baptist Church we're going to invest in the next generation we actually have two staff members that we dedicate to the next generation. Marty is our student pastor. He's dedicated to teenagers. We have Amber who is dedicated to the preschoolers and children. Uh, that's how important we think the next generation is. That's why we do camps and retreats and events geared toward the next generation. That's why we are building a building. Everything south of this wall is going to come down and we're going to be breaking ground here in just a few months and we're going to be building a new children preschool wing because we want to invest. We want to have a welcoming safe environment for our preschoolers and children to worship the Lord and be discipled. And folks beyond that, beyond all the things that our church is doing, I want you to understand this. Investing in the next generation begins in the home. Don't miss that, <laughs> right? I mean, our, our Marty and Amber are going to do all they can to kind of pour Jesus into your kids and to your teens. But folks, it starts at home. It starts in, in, in the living room, around the dining room table. It starts at home. And I want to ask you this morning, how important is it? And I'm not talking just to parents and grandparents. I'm talking to every adult in the room. How important is it that we pour into young people the gospel and motivate them to live by faith? How important is that? How important it is for us to invest in the next generation, share the gospel with them, and then motivate them to live in their faith, to mentor them in the faith. So again, think about that question. A great deal of that is done in the homes without words. Adults, kids are watching you. Dads, they're watching how you go to work. They're watching how you do your taxes. They're watching how you mow the yard. They're watching how how you treat your spouse. They're watching And how are we modeling Jesus in the home? And can I just say that's not easy? (laughs) Parents, can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, it's not easy. Because sometimes I'm just ticked and I'm just tired. I don't want my kids around. Because I'm human. Am I going to be the only one that just agrees with that, right? I mean, come on, parents, with me, right? I mean, it's hard. It's not easy. It's not an easy job. And so all of us, can, can I just, can I, understand, I think we all understand that our, our times, our culture, they're changing. I read the other day that our culture changes every six months. 
So I thought about my daughter, Olivia. She's 18, so 36 times in her lifetime, our culture has changed. Think about that. It's changing all the time. Now, the Word of God doesn't change, right? The Word of God doesn't change, but our culture changes every six months. So this is the difficulty. And I would like to suggest that one of our responsibilities as parents, as the church, is to give our children, our teens, a chance to voluntarily know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. We've got to give them that opportunity to do that. And I would also like to suggest it's our responsibility to mentor our children, to prepare them to live well for Christ. How are we preparing our kids to live on the ball field for Christ, on the basketball court for Christ, on the soccer pitch for Christ, at at music lessons, at dance lessons? How are we preparing our kids to live for Christ in all areas of their life? And I believe in our culture today, it's one of the most difficult jobs we have. Guys, it is not easy. Most of y'all know I have four kids. I have one that's married that lives in Knoxville. He's, you know, and I raised him, and we have three others that, you know, Olivia's a senior, the boys are juniors. It's not an easy task. Our house is like, you know, every morning, okay, where are you going? Are you working? What are you doing? And we're just kind of, it's like a staff meeting every day. We're just kind of figuring out where everybody's going. And on top of all the busyness, we have to kind of jump into their lives. So, so when I hear one of my kids say something, I go, mm, I don't like that. So I'm going to have to jump into that, right? And every time Leanne hears some, some of my kids say, you know, something that they're not supposed to say, we have to jump into that. And that's not easy. But we've got to invest in the next generation. So ultimately, what this means for all of us, listen to this carefully, you might want to write this down. What it means for all of us is we've got to come to a point in our lives where we say, listen, I'm not going to be like everybody else. Look, look, look around, church. Trying to be like everybody else is not working. It's just not. So we've got to come to a point as a church. We've got to come to a point as adults. We've got to come to a point as parents. And kids, yes, you have to come to a point as, as a teenager, as a child, and say, I'm not going to be like everyone else. And so some of you are saying, well, pastor, is that just your opinion? No, that's straight from Scripture. Let me kind of show you in 1 Samuel chapter 8. If you, have, if you have your Bibles, turn over there, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Let's start with verse 1. Follow with me in this story. It's an incredible story. It says, when Samuel became old, and most scholars say it probably at this point, he's probably around 90 years old. So he's old. So when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second is Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. So Samuel here, let me kind of catch you up, is getting old, and he was the judge, he was the priest, and now he wants to kind of give the family business, if you will, over to his sons, which is a pretty normal thing, right? The, the, the dad giving the business over to the sons. And that's pretty normal in our everyday culture. But look at verse 3. It says, Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So allow me to kind of clarify this passage of Scripture for you a little bit because I think there's some things we need to talk about that are going on here. I don't know, and the Bible doesn't tell us, why Samuel's sons chose not to follow the ways of God, okay? Well, we could, we could guess, we could kind of make some, you know, you know, we could kind of make some educated guesses. I, I, I mean, cer- certainly their dad, Samuel, followed in the way of God. Certainly if you read the Scripture, Samuel was a good man, he followed the way of God. But I thought about this and I want, you to, I want to give you kind of a few scenarios of maybe why his sons didn't follow in the footsteps of the Lord. I think, number one, maybe Samuel was too busy in the ministry to give any attention to his sons. And listen, let me just kind of be vulnerable here for a minute and say, as a pastor, I understand that. Ministry can just kind of eat your lunch. It can consume you. And I know there have been some seasons in my life where ministry was too much and I didn't spend enough time with my kids. And for that, I'm regretful. Could that have been what happened here with Samuel? Many of your parents know what I'm talking about. Sometimes your job, your career takes precedent over your family. Sometimes job and career get so busy, so, so, you know, so intense that you just have to spend all your time. And we make good excuses. Oh, it's, it's how I put money on the table. It's how I put food on the table, blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is it's, it's overtaking you and you're not spending enough time with your kids. Maybe this is what happened with Samuel. Maybe, we don't, maybe he didn't realize the most important investment he had was in his home of his two boys. Another reason that maybe 
It could be that, that Samuel did teach his children some ways of the Lord, and maybe he did grow them up the right way, and maybe as they got older, maybe they, they got involved with some bad people, maybe they had some bad influences along the way, maybe they, as a result of that, made some bad decisions. Both of those are possibilities, but hear, hear me now, church, hear me closely. Listen to this. The more we choose to invest in our young people, we lessen the probability of them turning away from God. But did you hear that? The more we invest in our young people, the more we're spending time with them, the more we're doing that kind of stuff. I've got to go, I've got to go, my God, prop. I've got a prop down here I've got to have. I just remember that. I've got it right here. It's my phone. You'll pay attention, okay? I wonder, I, I wonder if maybe what was going on here was that there was just not enough time to invest in his kids. And so we don't know this. And listen, this is why we do at our church, this is why we do camps, this is why we do retreats, this is why we do everything that we do. We're trying to invest in our young people. Because, folks, there's a danger in not investing in the next generation. Amen? Let me kind of talk about those dangers for me. Let me just kind of tell you, let me spell it out for you. One danger is the truth of the word gets lost. L listen, in our culture, the word of God is really, it doesn't mean much anymore in our culture. But, and, and so, unfortunately, the word of God in some churches is being repressed. And folks, hear me. The word of God is truth. The word of God is our authority. The word of God is our moral compass. And so when the word of God is not lived out in our homes, in our marriages, in our neighborhoods, on the ball fields, it's not taught in our churches, the truth of the word gets lost. That's what happens. And so as a result then, as the truth of the word gets lost, another thing happens. And what happens is moral erosion always takes place. This moral erosion, all of our morals just kind of seem to be washed away. When the word of God is, not put, is put aside, when worship is not important, when the priority of church and prayer is not a priority, once you get those things away, a moral erosion is going to happen. Listen, church, let me just kind of put it in a practical way. And I'm not talking just to parents in the room. I'm talking to grandparents, great-grandparents, people who don't even have kids, people who want kids, don't have them yet, they're going to get some, you know. I'm talking to every adult in the room. Listen to this. I'm talking to kids in the room, too. Listen. I heard this the other day. This just blew my mind. The average person spends 49 days a year on this thing. 49 24-hour periods. I did the math. That's 1,176 hours on your phone. And, and that blew my mind. And, and, and you've seen it. You, you, you've seen, I've seen this in my own world. I, I've seen this. I, I've taken my kids when they were younger. I've taken them to a park. And I watched where, where other parents would drop their kids off. And they'd sit on the bench and do this. For hours. Their kids could have been kidnapped and taken somewhere, and they would have never known it. You've seen it at the restaurants. You've seen where a family of four or five, you know, sit down at the table, you know, and everybody, everybody's on their phones. And I just, I just want to scream, talk, you know, have a conversation, look somebody in the eye. Let's have a conversation, right? But you see it. You see this happening all the time. Look, and, and listen, I love electronic devices. I love my phone. I love my computer. I use it all the time. But folks, can we just find balance in this? 49 days a year. So I kind of, let me put this in perspective for you. 49 days a year on the phone. What if we took that time? What, what if we took 40, let, let, I'll just lower it. What if we did four days a month? That's 48 days a year. What if we took four days a month and we poured into our children, our grandchildren, the neighbor across the street, that kid that lives next door that kind of annoys you? What if you just took four days a month and invested in them? Amen? And I'm not, well, I take my kid to ball practice. I'm not talking about taking them to ball practice. I'm talking about sitting down with them, having conversation. There's no phones involved. There's no practice involved. You're, ha you're having conversations about life, love, and other mysteries. You're talking about sex. You're talking about drugs. You're talking about mysteries. You're talking about life. You're talking about the things of God. You're, you're unpacking scripture. 
You're unpacking that TV show or that movie you just watched or saw. What if we took four days a month? That's not much. It's like 30, 31 days in a month. Four days a month and poured into our kids. And we start talking about their dreams, their goals, their aspirations, their future. Oh, church, let's not let moral erosion take place. Amen? Let's stop it. Let's show our kids the, the truth of God's word. Let's move on in our story. Look at verse 4 of 1 Samuel chapter 8. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old. That was a really encouraging meeting for Samuel, wasn't it? We're all going to meet together and we're just going to say, hey, you're old. <laughs> you know, that was, that was what Samuel had to deal with. And so it said, they said, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like who? Like all the other nations. Do you know what they're saying here? You know what the children of Israel are saying? Here? They're saying, look, 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 Samuel, we don't really care what you think. We just want to be like everybody else. We just, we just want to do what everybody else is doing. We just want to be like those other nations. It never says in the Bible that they even consulted about, from God about this. They never talked to God about this. They just wanted what everybody else had. God was their king. Samuel was their priest. And folks, basically by saying this, they were basically saying, you know what, God, we reject your leadership. We don't want it. We want a king like all the other nations have. And come on, church, come on. We have all been guilty. Come on. Am I the only one that's been guilty of that? You, you, come, come on. Have we, how many of you have at some point in your life said, ooh, everybody else has got one of those. I'm going to get that. Come on. Everybody else has been there. I'm going there. How many of you, how many, how many guys in your life have decided to do something everybody else did and you, you made a terrible mistake? Amen. Come on. Am I the only one? Yeah, four of you. Okay. All right. I mean, come on, we're, if we're honest, we all do this. And the Bible clearly says, let me just kind of jump over to the New Testament real quick. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this what? World, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Right? Now look at how the story in 1 Samuel progresses here. They want a king like everybody else. Look, what it, look at verse 6. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. What God is saying here is, look, you choose to disobey me as God, you're going to reject me as your king. Look at verse 8. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. I just love this, how gracious our God is. Our, our, we, we just make the stupidest decisions and mistakes and requests, and then God's just gracious, right? And God's gracious here. And this is God talking to Samuel. This is God himself talking. And it's not just some speculation. He says, this is not just my opinion. God's looking at Samuel and saying, Samuel, you just give the people what they want. Let me, let me tell you what's going to happen. Okay? So God and Samuel have this talk, right? And God's telling Samuel everything that's going to happen if these people are just going to head and get their king, right? And so then, look, look what happened. In verse 10, after God and Samuel had this talk, verse 10, So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots. You know what that's saying? We're going to draft your boys and put them in the army, and we don't really care about your kids. Then he says, and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. You know what that means? They're on the front lines. We're not just going to draft them. We're going to put them on the front lines. They're going to be our front line of defense. Most of them will probably die, but that's okay. That's what they're saying. It goes on, verse 12, and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to weep, reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. Basically, Samuel was saying, look, you want a king? Okay, here's what he's going to do. He's going to invade your family. 
He's going to rip it apart. You want a king? Great. He's going to come in. He's going to invade your family. Parents, church, listen to me. Listen to me, grandparents. If you allow the world to raise your kids, the world will invade your family. You know what I saw the other day? I couldn't believe what I saw. It was an ad for a special kind of car seat for kids. Now, kids that, that sit in car seats are what? Like six years in age of under, maybe five years in age and under. They're in car seats. This particular car seat, you ready for this? It had a holder for an iPad. For a three-year-old. You let the world raise your kids? You let an iPad raise your kids? Satan will invade your family. You, listen, I, I love the education system. I love teachers and coaches. But you let teachers and coaches, you let youth pastors raise your kids, the world will invade your family. It's not our choice. It's the teachers and coaches and youth pastors. It's not our duty to raise your kids. That's yours. And we've got to jump in here and we've got to do the work. It will invade your family. Look at verse 13. It gets worse. Listen to what happens to the daughters. We will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. We will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. We will take the tenth. Uh, sounds like socialism, doesn't it? We will take the tenth of your grain and your vineyards. Sounds like taxes, doesn't it? And give it to his officers and to his servants. We will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your young donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. That's frightening, isn't it? I mean, think about this. Listen, there is a danger of being conformed to this world, folks. Amen. We've got to invest in the next generation. Can I just say to you, newsflash, the world is really good at lying to you. It is fantastic at that. It does an exceptional job at lying to you. It's very good. Think about the commercials that we watch. They entice you to buy things that you don't need with money you don't have. Amen? And, and, and it deceives us. And this is a ploy straight from Satan. He, he says, yeah, I, I could see Satan going, ha, ha, the evil laugh, right? ha, ha, ha. Yeah, you go ahead and let the government and the state just raise your kids. You just let the media raise your kids. Ha, ha, ha. They'll take care of them. Right? And can I just say we're all guilty of buying into this lie? We, we, we pursue our own greed. We pursue our own happiness, our own desires, and we kind of stay away from God's will, God's ways, and God's word. So in our passage here, I love this. In 1 Samuel, God warns them. He said, yeah, I, I mean, if you want a king, let me just kind of tell you what that's going to mean. And how do they respond? They say, no, 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 no. We want to be like everybody else. We want to be like everybody else. So can I just say that there are times, listen, church, there are times when God will let us suffer the consequences of our choices. How many of y'all know that to be true? <laughs> this is what I call, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we learn those hard lessons of life, right? The school of hard knocks, Right? Or as Dave Ramsey called it, we pay stupid tax, right, for the things that we've done. And look at how our passage ends in verse 19. Love this. Samuel has explained everything to them that God had said would happen if they chose a king. Verse 19, here's how they responded. It says, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. That we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them to the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Here's what I want you to know, church. Listen. Sometimes God's just going to let us have our way. And, and, and he's going to do that to teach us a lesson, right? I know this has happened to me a lot. And when that happens, when, when God kind of allows us to have our way, not his way, we're going to need to take responsibility for our decisions. 
I mean, if you read the next chapter, and I encourage you, maybe when you get home today, read that next chapter. They do pick their king. And when things actually go wrong, you know what the people do? It's, it's not our fault. It's king's fault. It's all his fault. He, he messed it up. And to, a, to an extent, maybe that's true. The king maybe did mess it up. But you know what? They forget, they forget that they're the one that wanted the king in the first place. And so we're going to have to do one other thing besides just kind of take responsibility for our decisions. And most of you know this. Maybe some of you are living this right now. We're going to have to endure the consequences of our decisions. Right? Think about it. We, we wonder sometimes why so many young people are leaving the church today. We wonder why. It's because we're not investing in the next generation. We're not spending the time we need to spend with the next generation. We're not walking through with them the importance of what faith is all about and how faith has to be real. And I, and I love what my son Lucas did today. He, you know, that conversation really just rocked me. He didn't want to be just a pastor's kid. I, I don't want him to be just a pastor's kid. I want him to own his faith. Amen? It's his faith. A salva- Listen, salvation is a very personal decision between you and God. Period. It's worked out. We work it out in community, among the church, right, with other people. We need each other. It's a very personal decision, and I love that. But here, we, we've got to sometimes understand that we're going to have to face the consequences of our decisions. If we don't invest in the next generation, listen, listen I know there's a tremendous pressure on our culture today. There's a tremendous pressure on our kids today. And some of you older folks are going, ah, it's the same as it was back in the 40s and 50s. No, it's not. It's just not. Let me give you an example. When I was a teenager and I wanted, if I wanted to look at pornography, I was going to have to really work at it to find some. I was going to have to have, you know, I was going to have to know some dirty old man down the street who hid it under his mattress or something. I was going to have to come, I was going to have to be sneaky to kind of really find it, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about because you know. But nowadays, I mean, it's just everywhere, right? We know that. In fact, I, I saw this meme the other day. It just, it just really spoke to me. It said, it said um, a Playboy magazine has about 32 pornographic images in each magazine. A phone has billions of pornographic images. And then it said this. Parents won't let kids have Playboy magazines in their rooms. Give that some thought. But yet kids are walking around with these everywhere. They're going to sleep by them. Right? Tremendous pressure on our kids today. And adults, listen to me. We've got to invest in the next generation. We've got to pour into them. We've got to jump into the hard subjects. They they want to know how sex works. They want to know about how all that works. And and, and where where are the boundaries? Do you know what you know what has the answers to that? God's word. They, they want to know about all this whole transgenderism and sexual, you know, identity situations, crisis that's going on. They want to know about all that. You know who has answers for that? We're going to have to invest in the next generation. Here's what I want all of you to hear. Young people, listen to me. Adults, listen to me. God saved us to be different. To be different. God didn't save us not to be like everyone else. God saved us to be different. And folks, our culture is telling our younger generation to live in ways that are contrary to the word of God. And so my question, parents, and my question, grandparents, great-grandparents, students, kids, preschoolers, my question is, would you, could you dare to be and to live differently? Are you bold enough to live different for the glory of God? Amen? And I, I get it. I, I get it. We can't do this alone. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled every day with the Holy Spirit to do this. But remember, the Bible says in Romans, we can't be pressed into the world. We can't be conformed to the world. We've got to be transformed by it, by the renewing of our mind. How do we renew our mind? By the Word of God. Amen? 
I asked earlier, you know, how many of you got in trouble sometimes in your life where you tried to be like somebody else and you got in terrible trouble? Let me just kind of ask Christians this question today. All of you who are Christians in the room, have you gotten into trouble because you've conformed to the world? I have. So folks, it's easier. It's just much easier to do the wrong thing. It's not better, but it's easier. It's harder to do the right thing. And I'm, what I'm saying here, what I'm, what I'm talking about investing in the next generation is not an easy task. It's hard. It takes energy, effort. After a long day's work, you're going to have to work even harder when you get home and pouring into your kids and your grandkids. Our staff was um, talking the other day. and Actually, one of our board members brought this up at a board meeting, and it really kind of resonated with me. And we talked about it in our staff, and we asked this question. We said, hey, if this new children and preschool building was finished today, we were moving in today, would, would we have enough godly, servant-minded volunteers to man it? It's a sobering thought. And as a church, we need to invest in our kids and our preschoolers and our, our teens And when you serve in the preschool and kids ministry here at Leoma Baptist Church, you get to talk to them about spiritual things. And I know what some of you are doing right now. Some of you are going, oh, I don't do kids. I'm not doing kids. Like, like, Like you've picked that out of some Bible verse somewhere. Can I just tell you when you say that, you're not being biblical. Dealing with kids is not a spiritual gift listed in God's word. It's a duty that all adults are called to, investing in the next generation. All of us are called to do that. So I don't want want Amber, I don't want Marty, I don't want myself, I don't want to hear, oh, well, I just don't do kids. Because that's a lie straight from the pits of hell, I'm just telling you. We're all called to pour into the next generation. I would love the day. When Amber would come to my office and say, Pastor, will you please kind of stop announcing that I need people to work in the preschool and children area? Because I've just got too many. I've just got too many. I would love, I would love for you to come and knock on my door and say that sometime. I'd love for Marty to say, Pastor, we really have enough youth volunteers. We're good. I'd love for you to say that. I, I just want to tell you, man, when you, when you serve kids, when, when, you, when you're pouring into them, when you're, when you're sitting in a nursery kind of rocking a little two-year-old so mom and dad could be in the service, Man, you are, you are investing in the next generation. You, you are pouring into the next generation. You remember what I said? Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. So are we willing? Are we willing to mentor our kids? Are we willing to pour into them righteousness? Are we willing to teach them how to be, listen, how to be countercultural? I've given this a lot of thought. I know maybe some personnel team members are here, so listen up if you're on the personnel team. I've got a new uh, change that we're making. I'm changing my job description as a pastor. I'm changing Marty's job description, and I'm changing Amber's job description. It's now going to, because listen, I've thought about this. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Avery to come on up, and he can start playing. We're almost done today. I'm going to change my job description, and, and here's what it's going to say. Uh, it is my job to teach you to be rebels for Jesus Christ. Well, pastor, that's a little harsh and strange. No, it's just true because, listen, if you're following Jesus Christ in this world, you're going to have to be counter-cultural. You're going to have to go against the grain of our culture. You're going to have to be a rebel. A rebel is somebody who goes against the grain. Our grain now is sinful. Our culture now is is telling our kids things that are not with the keepings of God's word. So I'm changing changing our job description. I hope Amber and you and Marty are okay with that. I, I want us to be teaching and raising kids to be rebels for Jesus Christ. So can I just challenge you, church, this morning to invest in the next generation? Can I just challenge you to teach your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids to be counter-cultural? Can you, can you pour into them the truths of God's Word? Can you model Jesus for them at, at your homes? I, I'm just going to tell you, as you leave today, I want to just give you the permission to be different. 
be different. So here's what's going to happen at this invitation. This is going to be a little different. First of all, I know that in a crowd this size, maybe there's somebody here that's never surrendered their life to Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and that's you, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Maybe today could be a day of salvation for you. Maybe today you need to know this. Maybe you need to know that God in heaven loved you so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to be fully man, fully God, to live a sinless life here on this earth, to die on a cross and to take the sins that you deserve to die for, that I deserve to die for. He took those sins on the cross for you. And the Bible says if, if, if we believe in who Jesus is and what he has done, we can have everlasting life. I've made that decision in my life back when I was 12 years old. I've never been the same. There are people all over this room who have made that decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, and they've never been the same. We're not perfect. We still make mistakes. But, oh, we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. If that's you today, at this invitation, Pastor Marty's going to be right at the corner. I'm going to be right down here in this other corner. I would love for you just to get out of your seat and just come and just come to one of us and say, look, I would love to be saved today. I would love to turn my life over to Jesus Christ today. So that's part one. Part two is this. Maybe you're here and you're a parent, you're a grandparent, maybe you're, you're a member of this church, you want to invest in the next generation and you know there's some areas of your life where you have failed at that. Maybe you're a mom or you're a dad or maybe, maybe you're a kid that, you know, whatever. Maybe, maybe as a family you should come to this altar and just pray and say, as a parent, God, I, will, I want to pour into my kids. I want to pour into the next generation. I want, I want to talk to them. I want to get off of the things that I'm doing and, and things that make me feel pleasurable. I, I want to get and spend some time with my kids. I want to pour into them. I want to talk about God's word with them. I want to engage in conversation with them about who you are and their identity in Christ. I'm going to take it another step. I'm going to challenge every person in this room that's over the age of 18 to do this during this invitation. There's two baskets up here. And in these baskets are cards, and, and this one, uh, it says this on the front. All of them say uh, Psalm 145.4. I love that scripture. It talks about generational ministry. It says, one generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the other side, there's a kid's name in our church and his age. I don't want you to kind of go and pick one. I just want you to randomly just grab one. I picked Toby Weathers, age seven. Do you know what it means for me? I'm going to pray for Toby. I'm going to find out where he goes to school. I'm going to find out his hobbies. I want to know his mom and dad, his brothers and sisters. I want to know how I can pray for him. I, I'm going to maybe take him out to McDonald's get a Happy Meal at some point. I'm probably going to go see him play at a ball game at some point. He needs somebody besides his mom and dad pouring into him and loving him and praying for him. Now, you may get a card and you say, I have no idea who, you know, Susie Jones is. Well, if she's age 15, just ask Marty. Marty will be glad to tell you exactly who she is. He will introduce you to her, to them. Maybe, maybe you've got a kid that's three years old and you don't know who they are. Ask Amber. She'll be able to kind of guide you in the right direction. And you can get to know them and you can pray for them. And you can pour into them. And they can be a part of our church kind of investing in the next generation. Maybe you guys can get a little creative in what you do. Maybe there'll be some stories at the end of the year. Let me tell you what me and Toby did this year. Right? So everybody over the age of 18, I want you to come and get one. Just one. Don't, 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 just, just pick one. Don't be looking. Just pick one. All right? I didn't look. I just picked Toby. All right? I'm going to keep this one. I think there's enough for everybody. I'd like for them all to be gone. So everybody over the age of 18, just get one. And, and maybe as you're doing that, maybe you just come and kneel at the altar and you pray for that person, you pray for that kid. We've got how many of these cards were there, Amber? Do you remember? About 160. Did you hear that? 160 kids under the age of 18 that attend our church on a regular basis. 
praise the Lord, we have a multi-generational church. So what are you going to do about it? I don't want to be like Samuel and look back and say, wow, my kids have just strayed from the Lord. I want to do everything I can to pour into my kids. And I want us as a church to do everything we can pour into the next generation. There are kids that come to this church that their parents don't come. And this may be the only Bible that they ever see or read or see or hear. You stand with me? Let's pray together. God, I thank you for this time that we're going to have. I, I pray, God, that around the room, hearts will be convicted. I pray, the Lord, if there's a lost person here, that, God, they will make today a day of salvation for them. That they will receive you as Lord and Savior of their life, and they will forever, forever, forever be changed. And, God, I just ask that for families and parents and grandparents and adults in the room, God, maybe there's some areas where we have kind of failed. We have kind of spent more time on ourselves and not enough time investing in the next generation. God, I pray that you'll convict us of that. Maybe get, up, get us off of some of the hobbies that we have that we can spend more time investing in our kids and grandkids and our neighbor kids and our church kids. And God, I pray that as we come and we get one of these cards during this invitation, I pray, God, that we'll take this seriously. This won't be some kind of little gadgety thing that we do at church. But God, that we will really invest in these kids. That they will have somebody other than a mom and a dad or a brother and sister pouring into them from this church. We'll show them how much we love them. So God, will you work and move among us right now? And I pray this in your name. Amen. Come. Hey, y'all. My name is Rorick, and I'm part of the team here at Leoma Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you are blessed and encouraged by the message and the music today. If you have any questions or need any info, please don't hesitate to check out our website or our Facebook page. From all of us at LBC, have a blessed week, and we hope that you'll join us again.